So whenever you have a Lie algebra, you may want to try to integrate it. It's not always possible to integrate it to an actual uh, Lie group point, but you always get at least a local Lie group point which integrates it. And in this case, uh, since um, the Lie algebra has a canonical complex symplectic structure, we also get one on the homomorphic on the on the group point. So there's a homomorphic symplectic structure induced by the canonical one and the cotangent bundle. And moreover, so this symplectic structure is strongly related to the Poisson structure on X, namely the source map becomes a Poisson map. So you get a symplectic realization of your Poisson structure, a kind of desingularization of the singular foliation in a way. And um, the target map now is anti-Poisson and also the identity section now embeds X as a Lagrangian sum manifold of this holomorphic symplectic manifold. Actually, what we get is the notion of a local symplectic group rate which means a uh, local Lie-Gouperoid with a symplectic form such that the graph of the multiplication is Lagrangian, or here the minus just means the opposite uh, symplectic form. And in fact, um, you can define local symplectic group uh, with, this, uh, with this data here, and it's enough to recover the, the Poisson structure, namely, uh, conversely, given a local symplectic group right, in this sense, the symplectic form viewed uh, as a Poisson structure descends in a unique, unique way to a Poisson structure on X. And so this process of integration gives us a one-to-one -one correspondence between Poisson manifolds and germs of local symplectic group rates. Or germ, I mean that we only care about um, a neighborhood uh, of X embedded by the identity section. So anyway, it's a canonical uh, symplectic manifold associated with the Poisson. Uh, manifold and an intriguing phenomenon is that in many examples this um, carries an additional structure of a hypercular manifold. So let's see a few of the examples. Um, so we have a, we take homomorphic Poisson and we're assuming a scalar and we're looking for a local symplectic group right integrating it. So first if pi is non-degenerate then we can take the, um, the pair group right. Uh, this is uh, um, this has a canonical homomorphic symplectic structure. So here it's just the inverse of pi on the left factor and it's opposite on the right factor. So that's a, a group rate integrating the Poisson manifold. And as I explained in the first slide, that's hypercular, uh, at least if X is compact, because any compact holomorphic symplectic manifold is hypercular. And I believe the first um, who observed that is Beauville in, in 93, um, which is by combining Yao's solution to the Calabi conjecture, which gives us a particular Ricci flat killer metric. Um, and uh, using Boschner principle, it has the correct holonomy to be a hypercular manifold. Now, at the other extreme, if you take the zero person structure, then the cotangent bundle of X is a symplectic group right, integrating it. And there's a, a famous hypercular structure which lives on the neighborhood of the zero section of any, um, of the cotangent bundle of any Kähler manifold. And the zero section happens to be the identity section of this group right in this case. That's um, due to uh, Fakes and Caladan independently in 1999 and Fakes proof uh, uses twister theory. So at least at the level of local uh, group right, we get hypercular structure on this space. Another uh, famous example is when you take the dual of a complex semi-simple Lie algebra, um, then the, the group right integrating that is the cotangent bundle of the, of the group, where X here embeds a, a, as the fiber at, at the identity section, uh, at the identity element. And also this is hypercular. Uh, the proof is due to Kronheimer in 1988, uh, which is obtained by a diffeomorphism between this cotangent bundle and some gauge theoretic moduli spaces, um, where, the, where this can be viewed as some infinite dimensional hypercular quotient and the hypercular structure descends uh, from here. So you can see that in all these three uh, distinct examples, we get hypercular structure, but by very different proofs. We get Yao solution here, uh, to the Calabi conjecture, we have twister theory here and gauge theory here. And the upshot of this talk is that at least in, in complex dimension two, when you have a compact uh, holomorphic Poisson surface, there's always a hypercular structure on this cuproid uh, on the neighborhood of this identity section. And um, so initially, uh, when I started working on this project, um, I discussed that with uh, Marco Gualtieri and we were 
looking mainly at this example because there's a very interesting coincidence in the case of uh, Kronheimer's proof, is that if you look at this gauge theoretic moduli space, um, that's a hyperkilo quotient. And if you just look at the complex moment map equation modulo the complex gauge group, that's exactly the description given by Catania and Felder of the um, way to integrate a Poisson manifold to a local degrouped uh, by means of an infinite dimensional complex symplectic quotient. So what we thought is that maybe there's a way given any holomorphic Poisson manifold to, um, to make this Catania Felder, Felder um, uh, modulized space into a hypercular quotient in some way by finding a real moment map equation and, and quotienting out by a smaller gauge group. But uh, so far, I haven't been able to make that argument work. What I have been able to do is um, close in spirit to fixed proofs using twister theory, namely um, to generalize this, um, the second example, where pi is a non-zero Poisson structure, uh, which works um, in, in complex dimension two. So uh, before I explain this construction, uh, I need to review a little bit about the formations of homomorphic Poisson structures. Um, we had very nice talks by Brent and Travis on Friday, but I will give a slightly uh, different point of view. I uh, want to introduce each an unobstructedness result. Um, so let's take any holomorphic Poisson manifold, which you will assume is compact and killer. Then the, the this uh, bivector field, pi, can be viewed as a morphism from the cotension bundle to the tangent bundle, and hence it induces a map on first cohomology groups. But the codomain of this map, uh, you will recognize as something well known from the theory of deformations of complex structures. That's where the Codera Spencer classes live. That's exactly the space of first order deformations. But not every first order deformation integrates to an actual deformation. But Hitchin observed that all those uh, that lie in the image of this map actually do integrate to a deformation of complex structures. And the magic here happens in the integrability of this uh, bivector field pi. Uh, it satisfies some differential equations, uh, which enables us to solve um, the moral cartan equation. And moreover, um, the Poisson structure pi is deformed along the way uh, to a family of holomorphic Poisson structures for all small complex numbers in the neighborhood of zero. Now, uh, what happens with the symplectic foliation? Uh, it happens to be unchanged. I mean, the leaves uh, are the same as the foliation of the smooth manifold. But of course, the symplectic forms uh, do get deformed. And they are deformed in a very simple way. Namely, there's a global uh, family of closed two forms, beta, depending holomorphically on T, which has the effect of just shifting the, the symplectic forms. In the so if you have L a symplectic form, it's still a symplectic form in the new complex structures, uh, in the ho new holomorphic Poisson structure pi T, but the symplectic form is shifted by the pullback of this global two form. Uh, and I'm citing a paper of Marco Galtieri for that. Also due to the same paper, um, so this, this uh, beta uh, is interpreted as a gauge transformation of Dirac structures, but this is just a side mirror, it, it won't really play a role in, in this talk. So uh, what, we did knew, what we do need to know is that um, this form determines the com completely the deformation, um, but not every um, family of closed two forms gives an actual deformation of holomorphic Poisson structures. For instance, the fact that these uh, two forms here uh, have to be holomorphic symplectic imposes some nonlinear algebraic constraints uh, on the family. And I will explain uh, more uh, precisely what are those constraints in later slides because we will need to solve them in a particular way to, to get the hypercure structure. Okay, so now uh, before going back to holomorphic symplectic groupoid, um, I will discuss a more general result about hypercular structure near a complex Lagrangian in complete generality. So let's take any holomorphic symplectic manifold and X a complex Lagrangian some manifold in it. Then uh, the theorem says that finding a hypercular structure on the neighborhood of that complex Lagrangian some manifold is the same as finding a deformation of this holomorphic symplectic manifold, such that when you pull back the close symplectic two form omega t, um, you get uh, it varies linearly with respect to T, where the linear factor is a killer form of X. So uh, let me briefly uh, explain the idea of the proof. It uses twister theory. So the idea is that um, if you take the Lagrangian manifold X 
times uh, S1. This embeds, this is a dimension, uh, some manifold of the deformation space for M times C as the complex structure IT on the left factor at the point XT. So this is the deformation space. The fact that this two form here, uh, when you pull it back to X is non-degenerate because it's a Keller form, implies that it's the totally real sum manifold. So it's look, it looks like Rn inside Cn. And hence, um, we can look at this involution here by just flipping um, zeta on S1 to minus zeta. And since this is a totally real, real sum manifold, this has a unique extension to a holomorphic map from the deformation space to um, the deformation space with the opposite complex structure. So then you can use that to glue two copies of the deformation space to get a family of C over CP1. And also the fact that this uh, two form, when you pull it back to X varies linearly with respect to T, shows that you, you, you can glue that to get all the data of a hypercular twister space. And moreover, you have explicit real twister lines for any point in the Lagrangian submanifold. So these twister lines live in a family uh, in the neighborhood of that, um, of that complex Lagrangian submanifold. So you get hypercular structure there. But the proof is not uh, very important for the rest of the talk. I just wanted to give uh, an idea for those uh, familiar with uh, this theory. In any case, that's a very useful criterion because, for instance, we can recover immediately um, the Fix and Caradine matrix on the cotangent bundle of a Keller manifold. So if you take um, a Keller manifold, then you can just pull back the Keller form by the bundle map to shift the canonical holomorphic symplectic form. It's not too difficult to show that this is holomorphic symplectic um, for a unique holomorphic uh, uh, structure IT. And of course, when you pull it back to the zero section, you get T omega. So this varies linearly with respect to T. And then the theorem says that you get a hypercular structure near the, the zero section. Okay, so now let's try to apply that to uh, holomorphic symplectic group points. So take any holomorphic Poisson manifold, which we'll assume is compact and killer. Then um, take any local symplectic group point over it. I recall that the identity section embeds it as a Lagrangian sum manifold, and hence we are in the situation of the previous theorem. And then our goal in, is now to find the deformation of this holomorphic symplectic manifold, such that when you pull back the, the symplectic form by the identity section, you get T omega for some K form. Okay, um, the main idea is that we take a Hitchin deformation of the Poisson manifold in the direction of any Keller form omega. And then we try to lift that to a deformation of the groupoid. So let me briefly recall from the slides earlier that um, if you contract this, um, this two form by pi, you get a Cordera Spencer class, which is actually tangent to a uh, deformation of complex structures and the, the Poisson structure is also deformed. Um, and this, if this deformation has the property that the symplectic leaves are the same, but the symplectic forms are shifted by a global complex two form um, beta t. So now we can use that to lift to a deformation um, of the groupoid by simply uh, pulling back these two forms by the source and target maps in this way. So for all small t1 and t2, we get this uh, closed complex two form, which is holomorphic symplectic for a uniquely determined complex structure. Um, as a side remark, which connects to uh, Marco's talk on Friday, this is a holomorphic Morita equivalence between uh, these two uh, deformed Poisson structures like T1 and T2. Now, uh, what we're interested in is the pullback uh, to the uh, identity section. And since the identity section is a bisection of S and T and uh, is Lagrangian, uh, what we get is simply the difference between these two, um, uh, simple, uh, these two close two forms. So in particular, if you look at the anti-diagonal, uh, you're killing all the even terms and you're left with all the odd terms. So what we need to do now is just to kill all these odd terms. And that's why the conclusion of this slide, um, what we need to find a hypercalous structure on a holomorphic symplectic group parade is a Keller form on X whose Hitchin deformation can be obtained by a family of closed two forms, beta t, such that all the higher odd terms, except the first, are all zero. So this may seem like a rather obscure and bizarre condition to impose, but the amazing thing is that in complex dimension two, we can always do that. So there's, there's a way to solve these equations to get this, this particular 
um, gauge transformation of holomorphic Poisson structures. So let me explain um, how we do that on the Poisson surface. So as I said, this uh, family of two forms has to satisfy some nonlinear uh, constraints and um, we can express them in terms of the following recursive equations. So if you expand beta as a power series in uh, T, then the, the equations we have to solve it as the first term is just the, the killer form we started with. And then we need this to be closed, so the nth term is closed. And we need the zero to part of the nth term to be uh, this particular combination of the previous terms. But this term is not necessarily closed, so uh, we have to add a certain one one uh, part to be able to close it to um, a closed two form. So it's not too difficult to show that we can always solve this. Um, we're using Hodge theory, but this, we want a particular solution where the odd terms are all zero except the first. And then for that, we can use that, um, we have a certain degree of freedom. These, these the solutions are far from unique. For instance, we can always add DD bar of a function on the nth term, and then um, doesn't change the fact that it's, uh, that it's closed and doesn't change the zero two part. And the idea is that we, well, the odd terms are not necessarily DD bar exact, but we can modify the even terms such that the solution to the next term will be zero. And for that, um, we have this proposition, which is really the only ingredient uh, special to dimension two, which makes this work, is that on the killer surface, we have this particular uh, differential operator, which uh, you take a function, and then i d d bar f is a two form. If you wedge that with the killer form, you get a four form. And in dimension two, uh, while it's complex dimension two, so it's real dimension four, when you take the Hodge star, you get back a function. So this is a second order differential operator. And the key point is that it's elliptic and self-dual. So it's, it, it's a bit like the, it's like the standard Laplacian, but in a unitary moving frame. So uh, the main point here is that the corresponding Poisson equation df is equal to g, has a solution if and only if the integral of g is zero over the, complex, over the, the Poisson manifold. So um, the point here is that now we can pick fn, f2n, modifying the even terms using this proposition, such that the solution to the next term, which will be a higher odd term, will be zero. And then, so all, you'll get, you'll still get even terms, you'll get an infinite series, but uh, all the odd terms except the first will be zero. And that's what we need to, to get this, um, this result. So let me just now um, summarize what we get in the following theorem. Take any uh, compact holomorphic Poisson surface and dealt with a real analytic Keller form. So real analytic analytic T is a technical condition which I didn't mention, but um, it's a necessary condition because uh, hypercalar structures are ne necessarily real analytic. So if your killer form is not real analytic, there's no way you can get a hypercalar structure out of it. So that, that's a necessary condition. Um, and take any local symplectic group of it, which integrates it. Then uh, there's a unique hypercalar structure on the neighborhood of uh, the identity section, the X and G such that if you pull back the first killer form, uh, the killer form with respect to the complex structure I by the identity section, you get back the killer form you started with and, and the underlying holomorphic symplectic structure, omega G plus I omega K, is the original one on the complex structure, on the holomorphic symplectic group of it. And here the complex structure I here is the, also the original we, we started with. Okay, so that's the main result I wanted to present today. And now let me end by a couple of further questions. Um, first, while the obvious question is what happens in higher dimensions, um, there are a few preliminary computations which indicates that uh, we cannot choose the killer form freely. We have to choose a specific one, uh, or at least, I mean, there's a, maybe a subset of the killer forms which will work. Um, but for the two extreme case of the zero Poisson structure, uh, and the non-degenerate Poisson structure, uh, this works. In the case of the non-degenerate Poisson structure, actually the, the form that works is the one given by, by Yao's theorem. Um, but in general, in the middle case, uh, we might expect to use Yao's theorem in some way to adapt it or maybe to, to, to use it. Um, also a very interesting question for me is, um, 
what happens when the group rate actually extends to a natural group rate. So for instance, you can look at the Weinstein group rate. Then uh, what we have is the germ of a hypercalar structure on that group rate near the identity section. And since hypercalar structures are real analytic, uh, you can try to analytic to do analytic continuation to the, to the group rate. And the obvious question is, does this extend to the whole group rate? Uh, when does it? We have example with when it doesn't and the examples when it does. And when it does, uh, is it complete? So do we get a complete hypercalar structure? I know for a fact that uh, there are cases where it doesn't extend to the whole group rate, but I want to explain um, to understand cases where, where it does. For instance, if you, if you look at the example of uh, CP2 with a zero Poisson structure in the Fubini study metric, then we recover the Calabi metric on the cotangent bundle of uh, CP2, which does exist on the whole group, on the whole space and is complete there. So now uh, we can look at non-zero Poisson structures on this uh, projected space and they are specified by a cubic curve. So I think an interesting corollary of this is that there's a canonical hypercalar metric associated to any cubic curve in CP2 by just taking the corresponding Poisson structure in the Fubini study metric. And I think it's an interesting question to ask if, if they extend to the whole group rate and if they are complete there. And I will end my talk on this note. Thank you very much. Thanks, Max. Um, all right, so uh, are there any questions? <laughs>